So far, we've only talked about the names of our errors in statistical decision making. Let's talk about the names we have for our correct decisions. First, starting in the state of the world where there really is some effect, we have a name for rejecting the null hypothesis when it's actually false. That is, statistical power. Now, power or statistical power occurs with probability of 1 minus beta. It's simply the complement. On the right-hand side, something needs to happen. So if the probability we will miss occurs with probability beta, the probability we won't miss, that is, we'll correctly reject a false null hypothesis, is the probability 1 minus beta. On the other side of the world, if there really is no effect, that is, HO is true, and we fail to reject the null hypothesis, this is known as the specificity of the test, and it occurs with probability 1 minus alpha. Again, something has to happen if we're on that side of the world, and if the probability we will false alarm is equal to alpha, the probability we won't false alarm will be 1 minus alpha. Before going any further, let's consider for a moment the strength of our convictions when we make either of these decisions, failing to reject the null hypothesis or rejecting the null hypothesis. This should also shed some light on why we use this specific and probably pedantic sounding verbiage. We don't say the null hypothesis is true, we simply say fail to reject the null hypothesis. So starting with our reject decisions, if HO is true, we know the probability we would make this error and we actually are under complete control of this error rate. That is, we set our alpha level. If it's really of concern to us, if we're in a situation where it's really problematic to false alarm, we can set alpha to be very, very low. There are some hypothesis tests that people run with alphas of 0.001. There are times when you need that strength of evidence. You need to know that if you rejected and the null is true, it would only happen with a very low probability. So we have complete control over our false alarm rate. And this is actually one of the main reasons we do hypothesis tests. If we didn't care about false alarming, well, we would simply reject every null hypothesis. That would mean every time there really is an effect, we would certainly reject the null. Our power would be one. So we have complete control over our type one error rate, which makes us comfortable about our reject decisions because we can say something specific about the probability if there isn't an effect that we would have come to that decision. Now let's consider the other decision we could make, failing to reject the null hypothesis. And remember, in one state of the world, this is the correct decision. We should fail to reject the null if we're in a state of the world where the null is true. But if we're in the state of the world where the null is false, where the alternative hypothesis is true, this is an error. We'll be failing to reject a false null hypothesis or making a type two error. Now, Let's think about our fail to reject decision. This is what happened in that last study. That is, we got a z sub x bar that didn't land us in the critical region. How confident should we be in asserting that the null hypothesis is actually true? Now, we failed to reject the null hypothesis. We definitely didn't say we have evidence the null is true. But let's think about why we have to be so specific. Why do we say fail to reject? rather than something like accepting the null hypothesis or proving the null hypothesis is true. Well, going back to our decision table, notice that when we had a false alarm, we knew something about that probability. We knew the probability was alpha, if the null is true, that we would false alarm. We knew that probability was alpha because that is under our direct control. Alpha is something as researchers we specify. So we know the value ahead of time. We don't need to know anything else about the world, and we can say, if there really is no effect, we will false alarm with a proportion of the time exactly equal to alpha. Now, beta doesn't work like this. Beta will depend on what type of effect is actually out there. And if we're doing statistical inference, we don't know what the effect is out there in the world. Our entire purpose, the entire purpose of this enterprise, is for us to uncover what the effect is. So ahead of time, we cannot know beta. For example, say we have a coin and we're trying to uncover whether the coin has some bias. Suppose you don't know the bias of the coin, but I do, and I've given you a coin that is biased one flip in a million. That is, if you were to flip the coin a million times, 499,999 of them should come up tails and 500,001 should come up heads. Now, I know that bias, but you don't. So, when I give you that coin to test, 
you have no idea what the probability is you would fail to reject the null. And notice, failing to reject the null would be an error because that coin is actually biased. Now, if you think about it, if you flip that coin 10 times, you'll probably get right around five heads. In fact, if you flip the coin 100 times or 1,000 times, you're very likely to get a result that looks as though the null hypothesis is true. So your beta rate, your type 2 error rate, is extraordinarily high, but you have no way of knowing that ahead of time. So on purely statistical grounds, you should be very uncomfortable asserting anything strong about the probability the null is true when you make a fail to reject decision. It simply is not something you can talk strongly about because you can never possibly know ahead of time what the beta rate is, what your probability is of a type 2 error.